telling myself a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener-supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Radio. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven, Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's all right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. UFOs to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Aloha and welcome to the Cosmos Connection, and I am your host, Janet Carol Lesson. Teresa J. Morris is on her way. Hopefully she'll get here somewhere in the first hour. And I am here with Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, my beloved husband. He's another host on uh, Sacred Matrix here on Revolution Radio. And our producer is Thomas Becker. And today our very special guest is Russell Brinninger. We've had him on several of our shows before, and we just love it when... Russell joins us. He has a wonderful book called Overlords of the Singularity, and uh, it's so full of information, it's going to take at least a dozen shows to cover it all. But let me tell you a little bit about Russell and his book, Overlords Overlords of the Singularity, the Manipulation of Humankind by Hidden UFO Intelligences and the Quest for Transcendence. And following a near-death experience that, that revealed the underlying interdimensional nature reality, author Russell Scott Brittiger delves into the conundrum of UFOs and the paranormal, arriving at new theories and speculations concerning the hidden nature of the supernatural, the reality of the so-called flying saucers and their mysterious occupants, the profound cultural influences of UFO lore in the last several decades, and the ultimate purposes and agendas of the UFOs that have haunted Earth's skies for millennia. These theories involve various versions of the simulation hypothesis, i.e. the idea that our reality may be an intentionally created computer <laughs> Like matrix <laughs> that we are all embedded within transhumanism, the imminent advent of sentient artificial intelligence, and the relationship between UFOs and the impending technological singularity predicted by futurists to occur somewhere between the years 2045 to 2080. Whether readers are UFO skeptics or believers, Overlords of the Singularity provides much food for thought about many cutting edge issues of human philosophy and exponentially expanding technology. It's a must read for UFO skeptics and enthusiasts alike. And before we bring on Russell, Sasha wants to read something. Yeah, I want to read a few paragraphs from uh, this wonderful book, Overlords of the Singularity. And it's about 
about the Greys, and it's a, a section uh, called Searching for the Identity of, of the Greys, and I'm, I'm quoting Russell here. Gray alien abductions can occur both in real time and also in altered states of reality. Gray alien abductions involve either combining DNA with alien DNA or manipulating the human genome to produce hybridized upgraded humans. There appears to be more than one race or species of alien greys. We don't know if these alien greys are extraterrestrial, interdimensionals, angels, demons, elementals, inhabitants of Earth's dark energy halo, crypto territorials, underground or underseas uh, beings, artificial intelligence, biological robots. The greys could be a transcendent form of humans. They could be specters of our own collective unconscious, denizens of our own future, or a combination. Some of the abductees, such as Bandy and uh, Betty Andreessen, are, say that uh, we perhaps, are humans, are the larval form of the greys, and we serve a function uh, for the greys after uh, we die, that they somehow collect our souls. Uh, maybe the greys themselves are the overlords of the singularity. All right, so Russell Brinninger, welcome to our show, The Cosmos Connection. Thanks for having me. How are you me? doing today? I'm doing great. It's great to have you back. And um, let's see, where do we want to begin? I guess we want to talk about these great aliens. Sasha brought them to the forefront. Yeah, what and, would you like to know and discuss? Yeah, well, not just the greys. I think that you have a better grasp probably than, than most of us on all the different uh kinds of contacts and the main kind of uh, aliens reported uh, by people in our space. Well, there does seem to be a variety of uh, different types of forms um, from the Draco reptilians that you hear a lot about. Uh, some people believe that the, um, at least the uh, group connected with the Orion system, the Orion Greys are actually in cahoots with the Dracos in whatever they do out there in outer space. It seems to have something to do with uh, some sort of dominion, but it's not an invasion like we would ordinarily see in the science fiction movies where a physical spacecraft comes in. They actually do their business uh, from another realm in the uh, mental realms. You know, they have influences over uh, populations and uh, as you mentioned before, there does seem to be quite a variety. Uh, if you look into the Amicizia group that were here on this planet and may still be here from 1956 to 1967, they describe themselves as the precursors to the uh, spiritual realm. And this is a striking correlation. I don't know if you've ever delved into the Urantia book, but there's a species of creature called the Midwayers that are part physical and part uh, spiritual that seem to be able to flow in between the two worlds. And I wonder if something uh, like that may be in order where people can, you know, adjust their vibration and come into the physical realm and then go into these other dimensions. This may be a common practice. We're sort of trapped in a psychological prison limita uh, limited by our perceptual apparatus, you know, we only see within a certain visual spectrum, we only hear within a certain spectrum, and there is likely um, multiple dimensions interlocking with ours that we have no real perception of. There are some people among us that do have perception that we call them the clairvoyance or the physical mediums that seem to be able to see a little bit beyond the normal visual range into the ultraviolet or the infrared and be able to have some type of contact with either uh, discarnate humans that are in between lifetimes or other uh, extraterrestrial beings throughout the universe. So <clears throat> I've been spending a lot of time uh, reading into some of the old channeled material, such as the Rancho book, the OASPI Bible, a lot of the work of uh, Mark Probert and uh, Mead Lane back in the 40s, and I think some of these folks were onto it. Uh, Guy Ballard with the I Am movement, they were uh, referring to the Ethereans. 
and uh, saying way back in the 40s that we're not necessarily dealing with physical beings from another planet, but there's interlocking universes like J. Allen Hynek concluded and other dimensions that um, apparently at some point in their development, they are able to perceive us or even come here, but we have yet uh, to be able to travel to where they originate from. And I think this is uh, part of the purpose of achieving a technological singularity. Uh, Nikola Tesla played around a lot with the spirit radio and uh, claimed that he made some sort of electronic connection with the other side. And I'm pretty sure that somewhere between today and the technological singularity, wherever that comes about, uh, there, will, there will be an invention, a, a technological electronic invention that dissolves the veil between the physical and the unseen worlds. And this may be a crucial piece of equipment that is needed uh, to be able to communicate with a lot of these beings and actually understand who they are and what they really look like. Some of the forms, uh, such Russell, as the man. Russell, yes. Russell, can I stop you right there? Because I want to sure. address a couple of these. You, you just said a lot of incredibly yeah. wonderful things, and I didn't want to get too far down the road, and we, it wouldn't be relevant to address anymore. But there, there's a lot of YouTubes where they are communicating with the deceased or people in other dimensions. We're not sure exactly where they're coming from. So they're at least uh, bringing through uh, auditory um, messages. You can clearly hear words. Uh, so there's something going on here. You talked about Nikola Tesla and his spirit radio. But there are a lot of people that are able, are able to astrally travel and project. And so they're going into that realm. Um, have you ever explored the information by the Monroe Institute and Robert Monroe and his uh, books from, uh, I guess, they were starting in the 50s and 60s and it's into the 70s or so. I'm not sure exactly what era that was. But he was often encountering these interdimensional beings and he... Uh, you know, being uh, male, he was he was fascinated with astral sex. So he apparently was able to encounter other beings and and enter engage in, in uh, sexual energy exchanges. What are your thoughts on that? Are we actually are some of us actually uh, already doing what these Aetherians and these uh, gray aliens and other aliens do? Aliens do that we are able to uh, bridge the gap between the different realms and travel them. And Stuart Swerdlow Stuart says he does. Right, and Stuart Swerdlow. There's a lot of people. What are your What are your thoughts on astral travel and their correlations with the what the Greys are doing and other interdimensional beings? Well, I wouldn't rule anything out as far as being possible. I'm limited with own, my own personal experience, and I I haven't had any such experiences. So, uh, I would have to just rely on the testimony of people who claim that they do have and keep an open mind to that. I really like um, Richard Dolan's uh, recent interview where he talked about Corey Good, and he handled that very expertly because Richard Dolan does believe in a secret space program, but he, what a lot of things Corey Good is saying is beyond his experience, and he just admits that and just leaves it there. And I think that's a great approach instead of uh, you know. There's a lot of people out there that are throwing slings and arrows towards people who are telling testimonies that they don't completely understand or don't buy into. And everybody just needs to uh, halt that and just keep an open mind because we're living in a reality that is uh, beyond what we uh, are able to grasp at this moment. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, shun out anybody's stories. I recently read Leslie Keen's book, Surviving Death, and she goes into a lot of physical mediumship, and she's pretty well convinced me that materializations do occur. Stuart Alexander yeah. is a very quiet uh, physical medium that has met with the same group every week for 30 years. So somebody doesn't stick with that unless there's some really interesting things happening. And they're talking about hands and actual complete human beings that materialize from ectoplasm so you just have to uh examine the material listen to people's testimonies uh weigh what resonates with your own uh sense of what's real and what's not and just let, let the rest of it go and or file it somewhere maybe where you can access it later if you acquire a deeper understanding or more information um george yeah. van tassel was a, a an excellent contactee that told about deceased human beings being encountered on some of his abductions. You know, there were humanoid extraterrestrials and deceased human beings. So. 
Yeah. Whitley Stryver, um, his, well, before she died, he was talking about uh, experiencers were saying that they encountered uh, dead relatives often, you know, on board ship, and so something was going on there. And um, I was going to say, oh, and so, and then as a child, like, not so much lately, but uh, through my uh, teens and 20s, I would see my deceased, uh, like, grandmother and her mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, uh -huh. And um, and there was a man that appeared, and they so these were people that were dead, and they appeared to have the ability to manifest themselves to be to show themselves. Now the man uh, who I, I did not recognize wasn't a relative that was in the house that I grew up in could only manifest his head. And he had a beard, and he looked like he was some like from the 1800s or something, dressed something in the 1800s. But um, my grandmother was able to show her full form, and so I wonder if there's a correlation with that. So the the surviving death, the ability for the discards themselves to, you know, have such a strong desire to contact and reach between the dimensions. And so uh, Whitley Stryber is, is, says he has communication with Anne, who crossed over a few years back. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's just like uh, uh, Raymond Moody, who's doing uh, contacting the dead over these great big vats of oil and stuff, say that the person uh, who's seeking a relative, just like, uh, like uh, you said, sometimes don't get the relative they ask for. They get somebody who they'd rather not have gotten even. <laughs> Right. Yeah, a walk-in or whatever you call it. And, uh, you know, Keane describes uh, some seances where the hands actually materialized and they had them dipped in paraffin wax. And there's no way that this could be replicated. And apparently these are in a museum somewhere in France. So um, I'm about to retire in two weeks and I'd, I'd love to, you know, take some time and go to some of these places where some of these artifacts are allegedly exist and see them for myself. You know, I think this actually happened to you in a way when you when you had your uh, de death and revival experience that you died and your uh, 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 the self that goes beyond your physical body uh, was visible to you in your consciousness. I think it's very similar. Yeah, it seems like uh, all of our, you know, uh, as Dr. Stephen Greer says, the number of minds in the universe is one. Apparently, without our bodies, uh, we're all connected into something akin to the computing cloud. It's a field of energy, but it can also differentiate itself. For example, I, I just lost a dog that was really dear to me in January, and I hope to see it again the next time I have a chance to transition. But my concept of this is that the, uh, the entity itself is uh, dissolved or absorbed into you know, what Wilcock would call the source field. And, but it's able to resonate with your own mind and your own spirit and, and transfigure a portion of itself into that little creature if it's useful for you to see it. So we exist in a unified consciousness at, and at the same time it can also differentiate itself for various purposes based on mental resonance so, and, and that's kind of the way that i'm looking at it yeah um, you know whether whether or not there's right. an ethereal melanie you know my little yorkie you know off in some other dimension or not as uh you know is uncertain but i am certain that i that i will see her again the next transition period that I have, which I'm greatly looking forward to. I'd like to see all the animals that I was attached to in this world. And I think right now they exist on this cloud function. And then when I get there, because my desire and my mind and spirit is seeking these creatures that the source field will kind of transmogrify itself, you know, for me into these little creatures and I can have a great reunion. And the same thing with uh, deceased relatives and there does seem to be sort of a law of attraction going on uh, in this physical world. You can always see that it exists. You know, you're always around people of like mind. And if you change your paradigm, all of a sudden there's people around you that are, are very, very similar in their thinking. And uh, then the other mm -hmm. channel kind of fades away. Well, as below, so above. Uh, whenever you lose your body, you're going to be around beings that are on a similar level of advancement than you that are learning the same lessons or, or have the same concept of what this universe really is. So there's probably a whole spectrum 
of groups of beings that are like-minded with one another that have uh, from low to high understanding of uh, the true nature of, of the cosmos. So I'm trying, for the rest of the time that I have here, I'm trying to learn as much as I can and, and you know, increase my own resonance so that when my body passes, um, I'm in the midst of, um, you know, really interesting people. <laughs> and uh, it, even since this paradigm shift I had with in August the 18th of 2009, when I had the near-death experience and I was opened up to the, the fantastic uh, 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 cosmological reality that surrounds us um i've uh, attempted to kind of move my mind and my spirit in a positive direction and it's hard because people have little glitches and little personality defects you know like you know i, I like getting into it on uh, facebook with people in politics and i wonder if that's somehow a blockage you know to me that i should only be putting out positive things i should avoid little conflicts and arguments and all that so who knows? But if everything is harmony and, and uh, oneness, it, we wouldn't have anything to learn, you know, to vibrate against and be the apparent other and learn. Sasha has a burning chair. Go ahead. Well, it's just, I find it's an interesting exercise uh, to, you know, you can remote view and uh, and uh, put yourself uh, through someone's television set and be in, and be in, a, in, in a room in Prague or something. But there's another kind of remote viewing where you remote view from a person's uh, headspace from their phenomenology. And so you can uh, regress to, uh, you can say, I, I would like to uh, re see the world from my father's perspective. And then when you do that, you say, I'd like to see my, the world from my father's father's, my grandfather, paternal grandfather's perspective. And you can do that in the past, but you could also say, I'd like to go to a future life where I'm inhabiting another body. And I would like to view uh, my uh, 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 world and existence from that. And, and uh, you know, you might think you're making it up, but where the hell is up anyhow? <laughs> and I want to add one more thing, and then we should bring on TJ, who just arrived. Uh, but what you were saying earlier uh, was evoking this thought in my mind, you know, about the law of attraction and the animals that you find and the deceased relatives and those people who come to you. Uh, that also with what past lives or archetypes that we identify with so in some way uh, we're continually changing the here the past and the future by uh, like you said you were going to try to learn as much as you can and to increase your own residence so it's never too late to increase your own residence and affect those changes across the entire continuum uh, through what we call time and space and the totality goes two of ways yeah. it goes always yeah um so with that, let's all hold our thoughts for just a moment. Take a breath and say hi, Teresa. TJ. Well, hello, everybody. I'm remote viewing in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so TJ, what's the world look like uh, from uh, uh, when you remote view from, from uh, uh, Janet's head? What does her world look like from your perspective? <laughs> you. It looks like you. You're her world. You're her world. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> Dr. Lesson, <laughs> wonderful to have you. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. We have bad weather here. A little trouble getting in, but I'm here now. Russell Brenniger, wow. This is awesome, folks. Hey, Ahmed, thank you for being my producer and for Janet and Sasha. This is awesome, guys. Wow. And you, it, it sounds like you guys were into a heavy you know, cosmos connection kind of place in space. Are you doing like multi-dimensional remote viewing right now? What's up? What's up? That's, I was just, I was just suggesting that uh, one of the ways to uh, uh, gain information about other timelines or about your own ancestral scripts is to remote view successively being in the headspace of each of your ancestors. So even though you don't know your great, 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 great grandmother, you could by this method, get back there. And, it's, and this is what I do when I uh, study history. Or you could go to the future, or you could go to a parallel place. As long as you're thinking of astral projecting or remote viewing, you're free of, be, of your bodily constraints, I would suggest. Well, that's interesting. Russell Brenniger, are you one of those kind of guys? that? Well, I remember some of your story, Russell, from a long time ago, like eons ago. And then when you came in here to be Russell Brenniger, 
But, uh, you know, you're sort of one of those kind of guys. You do remote viewing, don't you? Uh, no, I can't say that I've tried that at this point in time, uh, nor have I exited my body and astral traveled. I'm very interesting, interested in the subject, and I'm interested in hearing stories uh, and accounts and testimonies from people that do such things. I'm very fascinated by it. But outside of my uh, uh, near-death encounter and, and what that showed me, I, I really don't have a lot of experience exiting my body and astral traveling, but I'd love to learn to do that. Well, when I left my body, when I died, that really opened the door uh, when I was in the second grade and then again later. So uh, I just thought everybody did that, you know, but once when I was sick, I got caught in my brain. I was really sick as a child and I never wanted to get caught back in the brain again. It was like riding a roller coaster with your eyes closed. I couldn't get out. I was so sick. So I've been very fortunate to have several levels of existence. But the remote viewing, I guess I, I spent a lot of time in the cosmos. I, I think this is rightfully uh, named Cosmos Connection for that reason. But there are several levels that I've been hypnotized to where I came back in front of a huge audience in Biloxi, Mississippi or Mobile. I forget which one. If I was in Alabama or Mobile, that's how much I don't remember. But at that time, uh, a gentleman took me back, hypnotized me to show people how it was done, and I went back, and I still remember today, sitting next to a, I was out in a cabin in the woods, and I went back and regressed, and uh, was sitting there, it's one of those on, you know, entertainment where you relax, and your arms get lazy, and your legs, and all that, you know how you relax totally, and listen to his voice, and I went back, and I was a man, and everybody was laughing after I came out at me, because I was like, what are y'all laughing at? And uh, he said, well, you were a man, a big, big, big guy, and you kept wanting to know. I'd say, where's my boots? He said, <laughs> where's your boots? <laughs> I was only worried about my boots, but he asked where I was. I described where I was sitting. So, you know, going back and you can be regressed in, through time and, and become another person. And out of body, I don't know, Sasha, you'd be better at that. Remote viewing to other people is that sort of like being hypnotized and going backwards too into a past life? Okay. Yeah. These are just a bunch of words that allow a person to have their own phenomenological experience. There's only one time that truly exists for anybody, which is right now in the imagined past, or the imagined future, or the remembered past ex exists right now. And so, what I'm saying is that everybody is a fractal. Uh, of everything else. It's a holographic universe and that uh, certain fractals or aspects of ourselves resonate according to our mission. And the mission is partly dictated by what uh, seems to be a, a, an insult to consciousness and that, that arouses us to action. And so uh, from my perspective, everything's, I know no one's going to agree with this, but everything's perfectly the way it is and it couldn't be any other way because that's how it is. But I know that's not what the main thrust of this show is. Well, that's okay. The I want to, timeline. Go ahead, Janet. You're, I just thanks. wanted to catch up a little bit about what we were talk, talking about so we can uh, get, let Russell tell us a little bit more because he was taking us down a wonderful road. We started talking about the uh, Draco Hotel, Reptilians and the Orion Greys and they're in cahoots with the Draco those and uh, so anyway we were talking about the different uh, urantia and the channeling and the readings and we went through time to Nikola Tesla and the spirit radio and how he was getting communication between the you know this realm and other realms and the dead and then uh, Russell was talking about Russell Richard Dolan's interview where he said uh, that these things are beyond his experience so he's just going to leave it there and keep an open mind and don't shut out stories um, then we talked about Leslie Kane and Surviving Physical Death, a new book, uh, and how mediumship of beings materialize from ectoplasm and uh, say, uh, seance, they were hands, they materialize, they dip them in wax, and, and Russ wants to retire and travel to, I guess it was uh, France or see Paris or something to see the hands. And then he said that Richard uh, Greer said that the number of the minds in the universe is one. And we exist in a unified consciousness field uh, uh, that animals, uh, that when they're deceased, they, they exist in a cloud form. And Russell hopes to re be re reunited with his deceased pets. Um, uh, I'll talk about deceased relatives and the law of attraction. And, um, and then Russell said he wants to learn as much as he can before he crosses over again with it, like he did with the near-death death experience because he wants to increase his own personal resonance. So that caught you up. 
Wow. What are we talking about? You either took great yes. notes or tracked him really, really well. My goodness, or both. I guess you do both since you're Dr. Lesson's wife. You're always good at both. So, uh, wunderbar. Oh, yes. like, it's wonderful, yes. Uh, didn't what? didn't uh, William Tompkins transition on the eclipse day? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yeah, that was so sad. I was going to call him that day. I was going to call him all weekend, and I said, oh, no, I'll let him have this weekend. I'll call him on Monday. I was going to set up an interview, and then I wake up, and, so, you know, he died at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's like, well, I missed that window. Yeah. What an awesome that was... way to go. I would love to transition on an eclipse day. <laughs> Maybe he planned it. Who knows? Um, so... Tell us a little bit more about your book, Overlords of the Singularity. What is the okay. singularity? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it an ugly thing? Um, well, what do we, we don't know. Or do we, yeah, yeah. What, what, do we, what is this? A, uh, the singularity is a uh, projected period of time. The futurists like Ray Kurzweil, who originally wrote the book, The Singularity is Near in 1996, uh, where he was prepping everybody for the exponential growth in technology. We've been going by uh, Moore's law where, you know, integrated circuits double in uh, capacity about once a year. And in general, our technology doubles about once a year. But we're moving into a, uh, a realm where we've never been before that we know of anyway, where our technology increases exponentially. And when it starts spiking, uh, expect some miraculous things, things that you thought were in the realm of magic when you were a child, you may actually see in your lifetime uh, in the realm of medical technology, um, being able to upload consciousness, uh, developing what's called AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. That's human level artificial intelligence into artificial super intelligence or sentient intelligence, where they're actually creating an artificial life form that has an identity of its own and is self-aware. Uh, there's, uh, we were talking earlier about an electronic invention coming that will allow the uh, people who exist in three-dimensional reality like we are to actually communicate or interact or maybe travel to and from the discarnate realms. There may be an electronic physical invention that allows us to do that, which all post-singularity civilizations use routinely. And they're just sort of like waiting for us to catch up until we can, you know, join them with uh, intergalactic travel in that way in hyperspace. But we had an interesting interview with Andrew, uh, Alfred Lambermont Weber, where he said that during the Jade Helm in 2015, the singularity had already occurred. And I've thought a lot about that since he said that. And if some of what Corey Good and the other secret space program whistleblowers are saying is true, there are civilizations in our near proximity that are already post singularity and have access to interdimensional and time travel and all kinds of things that we would just have the impulse to write off as fiction. Uh, but it hasn't occurred in the public domain that we're aware of as of yet. And, and that is the, the technological singularity that Kurzweil and Bostrom and um, other futurists are predicting that sometime between 2045 and 2080 in our domain, the one that we are immersed into, uh, excluding any breakaway civilizations, uh, will achieve our technological singularity. And I keep thinking about the Amicizia group from 1956 to 1967. My suspicion are that they are still here and have a base under the Adriatic Sea. Uh, if you delve into, uh, there's a lot of material that leads to that reality. And they are uh, what the Urantia book would call midway creatures, where they're the precursors to the spiritual realms, or there's a realm called the Marantia realm that Urantia talks about quite a bit. That's kind of a crossing point between the physical world and the spiritual realm. And that's where the Emesisia group said that they were from, which is really interesting. And they seem to be benevolent enough to where there's... Um, benevolent entities that can at least appear to us as humanoid and interact with us just like we would talk to another person. Whether that's their true form or not, we don't know, but they're able to transmogrify themselves and communicate with us as if they are a fellow humanoid. Uh, I think they're monitoring our progress in this direction, and there are some dangers. 
the Amicizia group talked about the Wearos, the Contraries, the CTRs that are an artificial race from Orion, uh, where they worship technology and they have plans of their own. You know, as soon as we achieve a technological singularity, they may actually borg a part of the human life wave that resonates at the lower frequencies to achieve some sort of artificial transhumanist immortality throughout the physical universe. Whereas uh, the ones that resonate beyond a certain frequency may uh, be the ones that go into this 4D shift, you know, with the solar flash that seems to be coming and uh, go into the next higher dimension. If that's, you know, what that particular soul is want, wants and that's what they're ready for. So there's a lot of really interesting things that are soon to come to pass. Um, I'm really curious so, to keep. Now, go ahead. Russell, let's. We'll put a bookmark right there. Solar flash. Tell us about the solar slow flash. This down and uh, so we can kind of, you know, break it apart, <laughs> slow it down. Because that was a wonderful download, but I couldn't even write that fast. <laughs> it was well, so um, much information. Let's break it down a little bit. Um, okay. Well, okay. So it's the solar. What do you mean by the solar flash? That's flash coming. Flash that's coming. Yeah, you got to explain some of these things to us. Well, we're, apparently we're, we're there's. This thing called the precession of the equinox that happens every 25,920 years, maybe just some uh, machination that automatically happens throughout the universe. Um, Wilcox work is really good in this uh, direction because this solar flash is predicted in multiple cultures, like, for example, Zoroastrianism, they call it Fragio Coretti, uh, where the solar flash occurs. Um, a lot of global warming is actually solar system wide. Uh, Mars right now is developing clouds at the equatorial region. Our uh, moon, which is probably an artificial device, is developing a natrium atmosphere. A lot of the auroras on Jupiter and Saturn are energizing and being you know, brighter than they normally are. And there's rings on the outer planets that weren't there before. So something is happening throughout the entire solar system. And Wilcock and other researchers are kind of looking to the end of this 25,920 year cycle that has to do with um, even punctuated equilibrium within the evolutionary process. And then it gets into the work of Harold Aspton and, and Dr. William Tift, where he figured out that all the redshift values were in discrete diatonic units uh, instead of representing speed and distance which is the standard astronomical interpretation of the redshift, uh, Dr. William Tift and others think that this is a dimensional shift. So when we look out there in Hubble and you know we see the redshift, we may be looking at uh, evidence for a uh, transmutation into higher dimensions, even even within the same galaxy. So for example, you know in the 1950s where you know beings like Valiant Thor and Orthon and these people that said they were from Venus. They might have been telling the truth. There could be an astral level of Venus or a dimensional shift of Venus where the 3D appears to be uh, uninhabitable. And that's a, that's questionable in and of itself. Some of the radar images seem to detect artificial structures, even though okay, the hold atmosphere. Right hold right there. Hold right there. Russell, you're great. We have to do 20 shows to get all this. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that we had Olmec, Olmec, Olmec. Uh -huh. said that she came from Venus right. and her realm was already in the other dimension. There was still some remaining in the third dimension. There was right. like one domed city and some people said they've seen seven domed city. So there were there was only a small uh, part remaining in the third dimension, but she was actually in a fourth or fifth or higher dimensional realm when she and her uncle decided to come to the earth and as they were traveling to the earth they manifested a 3D form for right. themselves, and then they landed in Tibet, where they have a training facility for people that are coming in from other dimensions. I want to give, uh, let's go round table here. Let's take a little break here. Let TJ uh, address some of the things we talked about, and then let Sasha, and then we'll come back to you, Russell. Okay. TJ, what would you like to say? Wow. Well, that was like you said, that was a lot to download. Uh, which part do you want me to address, Janet? All of well, whatever, it? <laughs> whatever bubbles to the top for you and, and, and well, uh, resonates with you and something, like something you want to talk about. 
I can only speak from experience. I've seen uh, okay. other dimensions outside of, you know, spacecraft not of Earth origin where I was standing at it and looking at it, and I know it was in my dimension. But being that I'm a student of multidimensional thought processing, it was hard for me to understand how I could see it expand when there was no expansion in 3D. So my husband and I had to conclude that it was another dimensional or portal opening and the uh, spacecraft couldn't explain it to me or would not explain it. Uh, I don't know if it had uh, authorization or not because it was hard to understand in 3D when you're a student and you're learning how to do this. So I've seen that open no, up. No, can, we stop? can we slow that down a little bit? What were you looking at? You're confused. Spacecraft. You were inside an intelligent spacecraft that was AI that had uh, the ability to communicate and you saw what? What did you see? Well, when it uh, when you walk into like through a wall, just like in a home, or you walk on a spacecraft, you know, like a, a shuttle, and uh, you you're looking, you walk in, and then you look back outside, and then you look back inside. There's a wall there, of something mm -hmm. <laughs> that you assume is the spacecraft. However, uh, there was a way for it to change reality on the inside of it. And I've been in, in rooms like that, and I could only relate it to Disney World, where you walk into a room and they shift it, and then you're, you're somewhere else. And I didn't understand that either. So that's all I had in a 3D world to relate to. However, I saw another room that, you know, when I looked, it's like a Gigi took it on, on the, just the 21st when we had the eclipse on her camera, and she posted it on Facebook. There was a portal window open up. And uh, she put 12 slides on, and there was a li literal door open up in space when she was doing the uh, photos of the sun. And uh, she and I just know things like that happen. You can't explain it to yourself or other people. So when you're seeing it in 3D, I believe there's other existences that, that are here, just like when I'm taking on a spacecraft, which sounds totally ludicrous to me in this 3D world. But I have to keep an open mind that other things exist because... <laughs> I've experienced it and I, I'm still working. right. I don't have the way to speak it in 3D world uh, English or any other language for that matter, but uh, I do have an understanding of it. So it's it's got to be uh, another way of speaking and another level of existing because when I've gone with well, Janet, you remember when I told them they said I can only tell you something because I asked, well, can I right. tell when they're like, you can tell Janet. And that was strange right. to me because it was like I was only being able to experience something that I had one witness or you can tell Janet. So that was interesting to me. So there's something going on for the expansion, at least in my own mind, where I can go and experience something, bring it back to this existence in this world and then try to explain it. I don't know if it's because they know I can't or because not everyone gets to do it, but there is something going on and I get to experience it in 3D. So maybe that's what Sasha's talking about. It's all going on anyway. So there's only, you know, one. Maybe we're in other parallel universes. I don't know. I'm working on all that, you know. So maybe that's what Russell's working on and everybody's working on because the time frame that my husband and I, when we'd leave planet, was a 15-minute differentiation for every day off planet was one uh, day there would be, we'd, we couldn't put back 15 minutes uh in a day but we'd be gone two weeks and what would be literally on earth 15 days we'd be missing for two weeks but when we came so back you were here, missing here and people were reporting you missing uh, like who missed you uh, well it, no it was government it was just in government, the government experiments yes. the government knew you were gone two weeks if, but yeah, you were only 15 weeks. days and would be only 15 minutes and they just couldn't believe it so it's it's just we know things happen, but we don't know if it is what, <laughs> how to explain it yet. So we're dealing with rationale, but we're dealing with the existence of time, place, and there was there was a word for it. It was like displacement, but it wasn't. Displ it just was gone. And from what I understand, with the people I was working with in these other places in space, they don't know either. <laughs> and this brilliant. And as old as they are, they just said we don't, or either they wouldn't tell us. I learned a lot of things was just not told. It didn't mean they didn't understand it. It meant they we weren't going to know. So, but that's all I really uh, Yes, yeah, so there's time 
in space and space displacement, and it can be in other dimensions. So I'm still working on that because I watched Gigi to walk away and come back in Florida in Gulf Breeze. And then I was taken up, literally taken up. And when I came back down, you know, she'd been gone the time and, and walked down through a, a space portal, I guess one would say. Now, is that mine? You know, I, I sound totally nuts, but I know that I wasn't here. And so the video was running and I wasn't there. So I'm, I'm working on all this because it's got to mean something. It has to mean something. Some of us are experiencing this for a reason. So I imagine Russell's studying it. I'm studying it. Dr. Lesson's studying it. You are. Even a mad with his paintings, he just keeps painting away. So keep painting that stuff, a mad, and put some dimensions in there. <laughs> I don't know how to explain Okay. It. Well, that's good. We'll pass the talking stick to Sasha. What would you like to say about anything you want to talk about? Okay, yeah, it's, a, it's about uh, this... I understand uh, Richard Dolan's uh, desire to uh, have documentary written on paper uh, evidence uh, from the government and so forth, especially in terms of how the government spends its money, um, because that's uh, uh, one way to find out. So I, I really understand that. But from my per and from my perspective, when there's a uh, concurrence of uh, witnesses. Uh, but not necessarily documents. It does have the advantage that you can cross-examine the witnesses and get further details and, and, uh, and do all kinds of things. So I think that's another kind of evidence that, that I uh, greatly value. And so as I started doing my research, I realized it was two main, main uh, sources. There was the old written sources, and Zechariah Sitchin uh, translated a lot of those uh, for us, and most of it's just about financial transactions and records, but there's a lot of real information too. And then there's the stories uh, that, that we get from uh, people that have direct eyewitness accounts, personal accounts of interaction with uh, extraterrestrials that were working in other areas besides the Sumerian area. And the most outstanding for me is uh, Stuart Squirtlow and his uh, 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 account basically seems to dovetail with this uh, a rancher book, and something ha has happened to me. Every time I start to read the damn thing, I fog out. So, Russell, could you give us a, a, a short, what what does the Arantia book say about the migration of peoples uh, from the Lyran group and their reactions with the uh, Dracos and how we got to this day? What does the Arantia book say about that? Well, the Arantia book doesn't mention uh, specifically anything about the Draco or Lyra, but it paints a much larger picture of the cosmos, and even if it's pure science fiction, it's worth listening to. I've got 100 hours of it from audible.com, and it's a wonderful thing to listen to. There's a variety of different narrators, some female, some male, uh, different types of voices, and it's just wonderful uh, to open your mind. I love just sitting in a lounge chair on a nice cloudy day and listening to the Urantia book. Uh, but it's divided into three sections. The first is uh, uh, it builds a picture of the cosmos according to this unknown channel back in 1932 that Dr. William Sadler, who is a total skeptic of anything paranormal, uh, a client of his, uh, her husband would go into trance and, and say some things that she was very bewildered about. So he started taking dictation and it eventually turned into the Urantia Papers, uh, which was published in 1955. But according to the Urantia book, our physical universe is only is the universe of Nebadon, and it is one of many universes in something called the super universe, uh, which is referred to as Orvanton. And then Orvanton is one of seven super universes that circles around uh, a realm known as Havona within the center of infinity, and it's called the Isle of Paradise, where the, the Father God lives. So it's a really uh, expansive cosmology. And in the midst of all these different sections, uh, it, it has over 100 different types of specific creatures uh, that it talks about. I've got a little three by five notebook and I'm writing them down off the internet to, because a lot of them, like the midway creatures, uh, corresponds to other UFO material that I've come across. So I want to try to correlate you know, some of the material that's from the Urantia book with other ufological sources, but there, it's it's very much worth reading. The section on the, the life and times of Jesus is just astounding. I mean, for somebody to have made that up, they would have had to spend a lifetime because they mentioned proper surnames, crossroads, places, cities, uh, 
the societal condition, the weather, you know, they'd really have to be a researcher of a great magnitude to have sat down and, and, and concocted the story. It, it rings to me of somebody that's dictating something they know uh, to a person that's in a position to write it down. So uh, the interesting thing about the Arantia book is that uh, Jimi Hendrix always carried a copy. Uh, Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead always had a copy. And Elvis Presley, it was his famous book, or fa favorite book. He always had a copy of the Arantia book in his dressing room. So all of these artist type personalities are attracted to the material. And it's one of those things that you just want to sit down and read or listen to with an open mind and see if it correlates with, with anything else that, you, that you've come across. But uh, it's very valuable. And then when I get done with my research on the Urantia, I want to move into the Owaspi Bible, uh, which was written by a dentist uh, back in the 30s or 40s. I think his name was Newman. And uh, <clears throat> he's got uh, an entire... A hieroglyphic language in there that's been examined by orientalists and they said that it, there's just no way that anybody could make this up so there is uh, material that's being channeled from somewhere into certain people's brains uh, that is pretty fantastical stuff and uh, it's it's nice but the cosmology that's outlined in the urantia book is is very thought-provoking um, it's got its critics because some of the science that it talks about uh, were concepts that were common in the 20s and 30s that we've since uh, changed our paradigm on. But it also says things that w there's no way to prove. You know, like, for example, we perceive the universe expanding right now. And uh, according to the Arantia book, every couple billion years, the universe respirates. So it expands and contracts, but stays in a continual eternal state of equilibrium. And there are uh, scientists like Dr. Ron Joseph that have concluded the same thing, that the universe respirates, it's an eternal uh, uh, phenomena, and that there was no Big Bang. So... You just got to keep open. Uh, the the science is coming down the the pike, and it's and it's really an eye opener. If you've looked at uh, the latest ancient alien series, they're really getting into some interesting stuff with the reincarnation, which the Urantia book talks about. But I didn't know this, but there's several major universities that have entire departments uh, dedicated to the subject of reincarnation. And the hard evidence is coming in with children talking about other lives and their parents check it out and all the details check out that reincarnation is uh, becoming more of a scientific fact um, than something that you know one has to believe or disbelieve in. And of course, uh, Christianity taught reincarnation until Justinian extracted it in the fifth century. So there's a, a lot of things about our existence here and about human spirituality that, that we just don't have a good grasp on. And I'm open to, you know, any material that resonates with me. I want to go back to something TJ said, if it's OK. She talked about displacement. And I, uh, there's a fiction author, uh, Philip K. Dick, and his wife, Tessa, uh, has helped Andrew Colvin combine a lot of John Keel's old writings into an audible version. And she talks about a phenomenon called Firebright that used to come into their windows a little about a two inch ball of uh, plasma like energy that flitted around like a moth. And I think one of the aspects of reality that, that we haven't really delved into is this idea of hyperspatiality, where there might be an actual two inch diameter orb to our perception come into your home and extract your consciousness into a huge ship, what looks like a huge ship when, once you get inside. And they can take you on an experience that may last, uh, according to your perceptions, two weeks, two months or whatever, and then reinsert you right back at the instant they took you to where an outside observer wouldn't have even uh, observed you going anywhere. So yeah. there's all kinds of things going on in, in that realm that uh, to our perceptive apparatus uh, just ain't so, but they are so. And also hyper acceleration. I forget who it was, but in Colorado, some guy captured on film at noon every day for an entire week, this little craft that came in that had fire coming out the end of it. They've had experts examine the film footage, and it's not a bug. It's not anything that you could rule out. And it indicates to me that there are craft in our skies that we can't see, not because they're invisible, but they're just traveling too fast. You know, yeah. they're actually they're actually in a hyper accelerated uh, state or traveling in bundles of plank time or something to where they're invisible to our eyes. But they're as real as rain.
Russell, I've got to ask you this. Uh, Tessa is a friend of mine and, and has come on many of my shows. Uh, but I don't remember telling her about my experience with the plasma ball. Uh, no, she was talking about uh, Philip and her experience. Um, I didn't know that. She, well, yeah, I she, has, she goes into some detail in Andrew Colvin's uh, compilations of John Keel's writings, uh, The Flying Saucer to the Center of Your Mind. Uh, there's another one, The Outer Limits of the Twilight Zone. And Tessa Dick uh, actually you know, ha has like a forward onto one of the audible versions. Yeah, I, I put a deal on UFO Digest about one that came in, and I asked my husband if he could see it, but it did all these uh, mathematical equations, super infinity, uh, all kind of deals on the on the wall. It was teaching me, and it, it was amazing to me. And uh, thank God I put it in writing because I was on the computer when it happened because it's hard for me to believe some of the things that happened to me, but fortunately I was writing an article for UFO Digest at the time. And I talked to Dirk right before he died about it, but it's, it's, it's recorded. I don't know how else to do this when people want to proof when it's happening to you and there is no proof. You're the only one. I mean, my husband had walked in the front door, but I was just downloading all this data it was giving to me. And uh, I looked and I looked out the window. I looked, you know, there was no way to get the light or anything. I was like, how the heck did this come in and I've, I've talked about it before so uh, these plasma balls were very all i could compare it to was a crop circle that it came in and it was teaching me things on the wall like light a light show It is no secret that the so-called mainstream media is best described as controlled propaganda. Countless news stories are either totally ignored or spun with half-truths, and because of this, essential facts and vital information are often compromised. Join Dr. Ott every Friday night on Studio B at 10 p.m. Eastern and learn why the story behind the story was nominated for a Peabody Award in its second year of producing unparalleled broadcasting excellence in 1997. That is, if you really care about learning the truth. Tune in to The Divine Truth every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time with Taj, Sarah Adams, and Nissa Norton. We present a genuine and authentic show with discussions and interviews with the people that matter in the alternative community. We ask the questions that nobody else will ask the greatest minds of the alternative community every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com in Studio A. We talk about everything from the Illuminati to the secret space program, multidimensional warfare, aliens and UFOs, mind control, and sacred hidden knowledge. The Divine Truth, exposing the truth without the fear every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Revolution Radio. Moscow's freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. The blood is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, the heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system He's telling him to run, but your knees are too weak to move. Fear. 
fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, reporting the danger, unafraid, right here where information never sleeps. Revolution, Revolution, Revolution. Radio. everyone, it's Barbara Jean Lindsay, the Cosmic Oracle. If you have questions about your past lives or future plans, need answers from the cosmos about your love life or career, or just want to keep your finger on the pulse of the planet, check out my show, The Cosmic Oracle, here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. The Secret Society Revealed. With your host, Joseph Atwell, author of Caesar's Messiah, The Roman Conspiracy to Invent Jesus, and Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, the groundbreaking discoveries that gives us a new understanding of how governments and elites use mind control to manipulate their subjects. Join Mr. Atwell as he lifts the veils of deceptions of our modern world. Mondays, 12 noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, on Revolution Radio. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Welcome back to Cosmos Connection with everybody. We got a lot of hosts today. We have Janet Carol Lesson, a mad painter, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we have as guest Russell Brenniger. And I am TJ Morris, also known as TJ Thurman Morris, for you guys that keep up with us on UFI Digest and Teresa J. But you know what? Russell Brenniger is just amazing, absolutely amazing. And uh, Sasha Lesson and Janet Carol Lesson has a radio show on to actually tomorrow night uh called the sacred mm-hmm. matrix and uh we're going to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk about their shows here and we do that right now because we're on the right on the break but we got to tell you we appreciate your support we're the number one listener supported radio network as far as i know in the world so please send in your little donations if you don't mind and we are at freedomslips.com so Please feel free to send us your PayPal connections with, you know, as much as you can afford to help keep us here. Janet Carelesson, you want to tell us about the Sacred Matrix and Tuesdays as well? Well, we're going to be having Tony Rodriguez tomorrow, and uh, we broadcast from 8 to 10 Eastern, and Dr. Lesson is my co-host tomorrow. So that's going to be a really great show, <laughs> to quote the late great Ed Sullivan. And beginning in, uh, let's see, I think it's September wealth or something like that we're going to be doing this sacred matrix from 10 to 12 on tuesdays that'll be Teresa j morris and janet careless and and guests and topics and so uh if you want to be on our shows contact me at aquarian radio at gmail.com a-q-u-a-r-i-a-n radio at gmail.com and tell us what your topics are and of course russell he knows everything (laughs) He's like blowing my mind. Um, and uh, when you're ready back to the show, what I have on my wish list for the second hour here is to uh, go back to this reincarnation issue. I've got a, a couple questions. All what right, did you want to say, okay. Sash? Yeah. Well, I, I, I hear uh, Russell talk. I already know what I know, but if I 
shut up, I can listen things and learn things. Learn things for Russell. He's a very brilliant researcher, Russell. You've come, I mean, you were you were very advanced when we, you know, last had you on, but you have come so far. You're like uh, leaving us all behind. So we had to slow you down so we can get what you're saying and decipher it for the rest of the world. Let's let a mad painter talk about real quick his show, and then we're going to get on with the Russell Brenniger show because <laughs> he knows so much. So, a mad painter, you're going to be on in the morning for roughly four hours roundtable. Tell us a little bit about your show and then your uh, okay. 11 to 3, and it's a call in show, and we'll talk about any subject you want to talk about. And how do they reach you tomorrow? Uh, a mad painter on Skype, or they call my number, I'll post it in the chat room and I'll say it out on air. And it's on Studio B? Studio A. Oh, you're on Studio A. Okay, folks, A, B, we've got two channels. So that's in the morning. So please uh, show up and support a Mad Painter. And also Monday night with uh, Mark Eddy, is that it? Or what night? Uh, yeah, that's Monday nights at 10 o'clock, uh, open canvas. And we mainly keep that to uh, some sort of history base. Okay, top. so... That's open canvas Monday nights, 10 to 12 with a mad painter, Thomas Becker, well-known poet and author, as well as Mark Eddy, well-known historian. And he also books a lot of people with the history channel, et cetera, et cetera, ancient aliens. And Mark's been around uh, and helped uh, mad for quite a while now. So, and then I guess Janet and I will be doing Tuesday night. I think we're going to call that Tuesday Ascension center, 10 to 12 in the evening, same time yes. Eastern. So, uh, all right. Well, thank you. Yeah, Anna. I'll be so, hanging in the background of that one, too. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Hey, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. You wouldn't that's believe it. this, but Thomas Becker, a mad painter, is our producer for Janet and I. So we're just a trio threesome. And Sasha Lesson is also listed on our group of co-hosting as well. So sometimes he'll come and bring his in wonderful intelligence. I just love Sasha Lesson. Dr. Lesson, we should say, and Janet, and I got to meet them in Mobile, May 6th, 7th, and 8th. It was a wonderful time, and uh, gosh, I can't wait to see what all we're going to co-create. All right, let's get back. So, Janet, back to you, but Russell, I think Janet wants yeah. you to get going on reincarnation. Do you need to... Well, I, have talk, a question. I have a question on reincarnation. Okay, a couple, couple things. Take took a little bit of notes here, but um, so... Sometimes, you know, we do regressions, and sometimes we get three or four uh, Lincolns or Jesus Christ or uh, people that are, that are claiming to be famous people, and I'm not saying they are or not, and I, I don't uh, judge uh, what they're saying. We just listen to their story, and we find a relevance to their own personal growth and healing. But you said that they're, uh, they're bringing that in and doing research. How are they resolving the um, that information that there's many people that kind of um, hone in on the same incarnation and that I have once you say what you want to say I have a possible explanation but go ahead okay well what do you think about that? personally I would not know how to account for multiple people claiming to be the same person in the past and uh, with hypnotic regression I don't know enough about hypnotic regression to really speak on it, but it seems like there are things coming through in those sessions that could possibly be real and and then other stuff that may be fabrications of a person's imagination. That's the way I'm looking at it right now. My opinion may change, you know, when I do a little bit more research into act, the actual subject of hypnotic regression. But where these uh, the evidence for reincarnation is coming, what the universities are focused on, are cases, there's a famous case in India, and uh, there's another one, American case, a young boy named James, who was a, a World War II uh, fighter pilot that died. And even at a very young age, he was drawing pictures of Corsairs and was saying that they had trouble uh, bearing to the left, going down the runway, and things that he couldn't possibly know or understand. And his parents were fundamentalist Christians. They weren't having any of this reincarnation stuff because they didn't believe in it. But with trepidation, they uh, took their child's story seriously and started looking into it, found out that he was on this uh, one vessel called Natoma, and they got on the Internet and found a Natoma uh, alumni group and uh, found out that the entire story checked out. 
but there's multiple cases they're finding out of children that are saying, you know, that they were these other people and having uh, trauma from that lifetime or, or birthmarks related to an injury that they had in that lifetime and then finding out that their stories check out. So there is a growing body of evidence uh, for the uh, factual occurrence of reincarnation. And, you know, they rule out they're trying to rule out all the alternative explanations, you know, like you're tapping into an ancestor's psyche somehow. Uh, it wasn't really you. It was this other person. And one by one, uh, they can logically rule these out. And they're coming to the conclusion at the universities that uh, this child, James, and the Indian example uh, were, in fact, these people from the past. So reincarnation what? may actually come into the mainstream pretty soon to where it's just something we all accept that happens. And there's also a story in okay. the raw material. Yeah. Oh, Sash wanted to uh, add something. Well, it's just, uh, th that's just one of my fields that I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, it's easy to think of the, uh, for me to think of uh, the five people saying they're Lincoln and, and they may well be uh, accessing different, and subpersonalities uh, of Lincoln, and so when I regress people in their subpersonalities, they get to totally different uh, past lives. And what we find in psychotherapy is there's a resonance at all times. So, for example, right now I'm having a resonance uh, with you, Russell, and it's would resonate with something with probably the way I related to my father in my childhood, and would resonate with some. Uh, paternal uh, son relationship in my past life imaging and uh, and so forth and all the way to uh, my relationship with the singularity in me and and so that uh, in psychotherapy we don't make value judgments as to the ontological uh, uh, status of a person's symboling and we find it's all valid if you don't crush it and it can all lead to insights and uh, uh, wider choices that's my opinion Great. I just wanted to add that the research by the Dr. Michael Newton Institute, where they have regressed, I think, about seven, or no, about 30 or 40,000 people uh, from many cultures all over the planet and many different hypnotherapists doing regressions, and they would all report back to the Institute their findings of the results. And what they found and uh, is that souls, when they're very advanced souls, they're older souls, they've been through thousands of incarnations or hundreds, of, and they're, they've mastered the ability to send threads of their consciousness down into yeah. more than one person at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that's part of your research, but I highly recommend the Dr. Michael Newton Institute. Um, and also uh, there's information in the Emerald Towns of Delt that he was the thrice-born Hermes and he is a, an old soul and a master so the ability to send your consciousness down into different bodies simultaneously to have these multiple experiences and one of the things I got in one of my downloads was that the the, the gods of ancient times like Enki and the you know Ninma and all these different people to accelerate consciousness the ones that are uh, for the light uh, forces of light and good goodness um, to accelerate consciousness, have learned how to thread their consciousness, or send their threads of consciousness down into many forms in hopes that it's kind of like sending out your seeds in hopes that more, more than one wake up to help accelerate this process for all of humanity. Go ahead, Sasha. Oh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to finish the little part that I was saying. Uh, a feller named Stevenson uh, was taking these Indian. Indian children from India who had said, you know, I, I'm from another village. I'm from this. And they start describing the village in a place they'd never been far away. And he would actually bring them back. And he found, yes, indeed, that, that they did uh, belong there, too. Uh, and I myself have actually witnessed uh, uh, in a holotropic breath work a person speaking a language that he didn't know. They record it. We look it up later. It turns out to be ancient Japanese. And uh, my, I was with uh, Stan. And Groff, uh, my teacher, who kept working with this fellow who was obsessed with uh, a past life where he was a Spanish uh, priest uh, in the galleons that were invading um, England. And, the, and the, of course, the uh, Spanish were defeated and this guy made it to shore and he hid his signet ring in this cave. And so this fellow, Stan's client, was obsessed with going back to England and finally went there and he found he was driven to find that cave and he found it and there was a signet ring. And then there's a famous case of Brady Murphy who remembered all these artifacts that were in the uh, uh, in ancient Ireland but it turns out as a child 
she had visited the Chicago uh, Expo where they had a, a uh, exposition of ancient uh, Irish domestic artifacts. And so that's what we have to uh, uh, watch out for, this false memory uh, syndrome where people are actually are remembering something, but it isn't something that uh, they directly experienced. Helen Keller remembered a, uh, it's called cryptonesia, remembered a, 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 wrote an entire book, and it turns out it was word for word, something someone had read to her when she was a child. It's amazing. In uh, Titus Levy's writing, they refer to the Sibylline prophecies quite a bit. Uh, apparently, ah. that was a huge part of their culture back then. They would go on portents like uh, lightning striking at the Temple of Jupiter or a goat reported to have spoken or uh, a baby born with a deformity. And then they would uh, refer to the Sibylline books, you know, as to where to go from there. And it usually had to do with some village they were invading or something. It's uh, like one war after another. Um but uh, I, that's one thing I also want to look into is Sybil, you know, the Sibylline material, because apparently uh, yeah. she uh, had come up with some really interesting stuff. But what you just said uh, reminds me of how linear we like to think. And if something doesn't make sense to us, you know, like the multiple people reporting that they were Abraham Lincoln, what you said, Dr. Sasha Lesson, was uh really interesting that they might be tapping into sub personalities and all of them could potentially be reporting truth uh, with a different aspect of uh, Lincoln's psyche. I mean, who knows? We just, uh, we're not, we're just learning how to think about this reality and we got to avoid the linear type thinking that we do. We, you know, we impulsively say, well, only one of them could be telling the truth and that's not necessarily so. In my own case, uh, since I was a child and I was able to pick up a pencil, I've driven little scribbles and looking back into them, it was Islamic architecture uh, with the points and on all the hallways and the doorways and everything. And uh, wow. ever since I was a child, uh, I've re related to, uh, I've, I've always been interested in camels and, you know, I scribbled the Islamic architecture. And <clears throat> when I was really young, I imagined as a child that I had been Muslim. I was really attracted to Sinbad and, you know, all, all the uh, Islamic uh, oriented tales. And I personally think that at one point in time, uh, I was a uh, Muslim in the past and we had camels and I had three wives and we sold tapestries and nuts along a trade route. And I just have like little fragments of memories of this former life. But this has been with me since childhood and it's never gone away. It's just been a part of my psyche that I at least imagine myself in that role. That's funny. I have one of those memories, too. With Like, I don't, it's not really a sin bad, but I feel like I know what you're talking about with a secret wall and back in the day and you know, camels and all of that. I don't know what time frame that was, but I do have, I had those from the time I was little too, and I could talk about them and point to them. But uh, I, where do those memories come from, right? But you feel very, I love the magic carpet stories. It, 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 you know, when you're a child and you're looking at all that, oh, yeah. camels and the people, and I always felt like I'd lived there before when I was a child. It was like looking at home. It's funny because as we're talking, I'm looking in my room here, and I've got a pair of those pointy ge genie shoes, and, uh, <laughs> one of the one of the sultan's hats, and you know, oh it, it's, I've, always, I've always been attracted to that oh, open talking. sesame. I remember playing open sesame when I was a kid, you know. But the uh, the raw material has an interesting thing to say about uh, in between lifetimes about a particular abduction of uh, Charles Hickson back in 1973, the Pascagoula abduction. And apparently, according to this entity, Ra, that came through Carl Ruckert in the 80s, uh, he had agreed upon this experience uh, with some beings from Sirius prior to this incarnation because they wanted to learn about human war. And uh, I guess he was a veteran. And during that addiction experience, they scanned his mind for all the emotions and trauma and everything that he had experienced in wartime. So that may be a possible purpose uh, of that abduction. Yes, interesting. Well, well, uh, Janet, has Dr. Lesson ever heard that part of uh, of the command and Andromeda and all that with me before? No, I don't even no, know. No, go ahead and tell us. No, what would Russell, you like to share? Russell, have you heard of, of that? Because it sort of fits with what we're talking about. But uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Tell us. Tell us. It, it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, it, it's not a past life because it's in this reality. So it's 
it's a, a lot of past lives that because of the history of who I am when I've died and came back and died and came back in this lifetime allowed me to remember a lot and I'm, I'm putting it together for me but this galaxy uh, when I learned about various universes and for first hand and with these beings that come and go from this other galaxy and this other universe but when they found us by accident this is this is in my reality in this life you know I'm 65 now but in my 30s and since the time I was born and my uncle worked in Los Alamos okay and then I went to White Sands in the second grade and got you know willed myself there after having hepatitis and had died so when we come back we may have some reincarnation issues but apparently I knew of, of some being very very old soul for many 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 lifetimes and so these beings from what I understand they say they knew us before we were born and meant it so it was hard to understand all this so I've got this huge book I need to write but inside of that is the fact that they taught me about other universes I believe you know how I was just thinking about that today how they all blend together and it's like they they meet and it's like if you ever seen these two big round toilet tissue things that roll out in the bathroom and they'll come in in the middle and that's the the brain b-r-a-n-e between the universes and so they taught me about all of these things and I'm trying to find ways to explain it to this you know I, and I did it for years I, I worked with physics and, and wrote books and help people and had somebody in China put my name in a book and the dot theory and how this all works for years and I quit but right so now you're saying it's, it's like it's like the corpus callosum that uh, joins the uh, right and left hemispheres of the human brain yes but it's called brane and there's this thin layer between universes but yeah exactly uh -huh. we're sort of a continuation of that and they have a uh, that's important because the universes are separate by this layer and they can uh they can it's like a reality or a resonance or a vibration off of those and i those uh i remember studying all this and and, and it wasn't here russell it was in a command what, what janet and i call a command ship but we call it the what well, janet for lack of better words calls it the secret space program but it, it yeah but since i'm working with beings it's we call it the ufo secret space we have a little website a little facebook thing on it but we're starting to bring people together but this stuff that i got i haven't heard anybody else talk about it so right. i'm wondering if that's part of this me being here in this in this era because uh i believe somehow we all connect the dots again but this this ship and these people they said that they found us by accident but that we've obviously been here for quite some time and they're the ones that worked with Tom and I and they were also the ones working in this lifetime as far as I know when I was working for uh, my husband and I working during the Reagan era 80 to 93 and Reagan wanted to know about it you know he had seen a spacecraft so certain things fit together and this show is no accident and it was so I could start sort of helping drop some information here and there so we can finally start finding out who's really interested in expanding universally and expanding what we call the ascension age which is like you said every 2000 what is it 500 920 yeah so i feel like that that's important but these beings up there they were as real as you or i and they just are amazed they didn't understand uh why we couldn't use more of, of our imagination and and they don't, don't understand why we wore and they taught me about how we work together with other you know species and that we're various groups of species uh, blended together from what they can study and they even have a research group that's not supposed to take people but they do and they put them back but I never heard they never discussed any of these draconian or any things that, that any kind of the knowledge we have here I, I got it firsthand and it was strictly you know beings that have been thousands and thousands of years old now they did tell me about uh in my husband too uh, monitoring uh world war ii though they were here then and how they came and went and my husband uh met uh, some of the people that were it, it didn't uh, it doesn't make sense to us that's why I, even if i write it i'm, I'm like how am i going to make all this make sense but some of the people because they live so long even though they're humans and look like us they come and go they come down here and they work and they go back 
And I'm hoping that's what happened to my husband and what happens to me. So it's sort of like knowing that you're an immortal soul and you come down here and you work in flesh and you go back up there and it's a choice. And some of them work in other countries. You can choose your, your location and your, your accent and what you'll be wearing and all of that. They've got an explanation for everything that we do down here. But they started monitoring us a long, long, long time ago. But the one thing that we're most interested in is how Tom and I would perceive and imagine and, and work out our own solutions. That just amazed them. They have their own uh, military. They have their own communication. They have their, they have things that look like cows, but they're not cows. <laughs> they're similar to cows. They eat meat. They're not just vegetarians. There's all kind. There's a whole world out there, a whole other universe, you know, people. And I think that's sort of what Janet wants me to bring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TJ. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated. You, you were saying that they, they taught you how to cooperate, how they get along. Um, how many different species were there? And do, do you have this information? Because we could put this in a book form or some kind of show and teach humanity how you get along with species that are not from the same planet or the same origin. Well, yeah. Do you have any of that information? Well, yeah, they. Uh, well, you know, Tom and I. Well, Tom and I started at 28 there that we're working in that particular time frame, but uh, by the time, you know, if you remember, Tom and I were trying to keep up with what the once humans spoke about, and it's in one of my books, 68 or 69, but it's all out there in Google and in books I've written and the history and. It's all out there, and it's cross-referenced with well, humans. Let's be here now because we can't find that stuff. It's just uh, we can't even find half of it. You and I can't even find half of it because we've had computer crashes and stuff. Start with the top five. Start, start with how did they – okay, you said a couple things that really stuck in my mind. You said that they taught you – they cooperate, and they live so long, and they work and go back. They come here. Uh -huh. They choose their location. But they basically cooperate and they monitor humanity and they know how to get along. Yeah. And so what do, what's their secret? They taught you this. What did they teach you about getting along? But what, aren't there wars in space? Um, they're, they, they have an alliance uh, universally with universe to universe and then all those that are under the commands. But from what I understand where we are, this is off limits. And they're not supposed to bother this because we're a young, uh, we're, we're a very young uh, conglomeration, our group of DNA and the 23 chromosomes. And so for, it was my understanding that when they mess, when they found us, that was uh, prior to uh, the mixture of, uh, I guess you'd say the races, maybe the Anunnaki and the Bible story. Uh, they found us before that from what i understand and so the right. race that, so, so then the, you know as far along, as, since our realm and uh, we're you know mixed with the anunnaki and they they have a violent past and so there's part of uh existence in the continuum and human being type species humanoid species that are violent and warlike but these are humanoid species and they don't seem to have the violent dna no those what were the ones we worked with they were they were so thousands of years old they inbred they they did not like the warring factor the wars uh my daughter understands it better than i do she's younger than i do but uh you know that's why we're here genetic and working on dna so how does they said on how you do this he said well, they, they, they read it out. They'd read it out among all the races. The only, but then they found out from that other universe where they know if they come and go, that wharf-looking group, they were shocked because they went over and on one of the worlds, they did what they we called rape and pillage. They go in, they, they uh, it was the gray colony, the, the, the little little bitty grays. They, you know, they're very, they're very uh, highly intelligent. They're very. Uh, they're very sensitive, and so there's several different types, you know, and they're not bad. They just, when they went back to take them from the, the working with this group in this particular command, and I call it the Andromeda because that was the group I was assigned to, the quadrant of this particular universe. And so when they went back to take them to deliver them, uh, the their their world was 
ransacked. It was there's nothing to take them back to. All the people were gone, and the, it was like Mars. So it was like they couldn't take them back. So that became a big, that became the uh, education we had, Tom and I. And that's when they changed the reality for Tom and I, that Tom had to start teaching that group that didn't know how to fight. You know, they took him, and he had to uh, teach women and men both how to, they didn't know how to fight. They didn't know how to feel. They didn't, they didn't have the emotion. They didn't have the warring gene. So it's been bred back into this particular planet, the people, because it, it, these beings. So now they had to know they had the alliance and the, the beings from the Illyrian and the Anu. The, that, from what I understand, that's the highest group I was allowed to know about. Were the is it Illyrians in that it Sasha Illyrians? The, Illyrians, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's, the that's the highest group we were told about, and they they were the ones that they're even older than them. These were the ones that went up to the Supreme High Council for all the universes. So. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, you know, to you, one of the things that Russell and uh, he'll tell us more about it uh, has suggested is is that uh, maybe uh, they've already completed their uh, genetic experiment, and the hybrids uh, that they that have been placed among us, or enough of us are hybrid enough, that the transition has already been made, and we we are we and the greats are one. <laughs> Could you say some more about that, Russell? Well, yeah, Dr. David Jacobs has been studying this for about 50 years, and he noticed that the narratives of the abductions have changed over time. You know, at first they were being picked up like Benny and Barney Hill and um, Betty and Barney Hill, excuse me, and, uh, you know, the medical experimentation and different things like that. And then the taking of uh, sperm and ova, and then it moved into holding hybrid children or watching films and seeing if you could tell which were the aliens and which were, were looked human. And the most recent version of uh, his abduction narratives is the people being abducted into apartments and showing how the hybrid teaching hybrid teenagers how to arrange your furniture in their living room. I mean, it, it's a, a continue continuity uh, of narration that's cross cultural and you know, it doesn't seem to be a product of the United States and our mythos or science fiction or anything. He's, uh, you know, worked with people from other countries and other cultures, and they all, they're all saying the same thing. But he sort of has a, uh, a kind of a foreboding feeling about it, whereas I, I, I really don't. I think uh, that the upgrade has already been done. If you think about it, you know, starting in about 1961 uh, with those original abductions, you heard about the cattle mutilations, uh, they were coincided, and then all of a sudden it just sort of stopped. You, you didn't hear so much about the abduction experiences and uh, the cattle mutilations sort of ceased. And whatever they were doing with all that seems to be a project that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I think they've put enough of an upgrade into our population. The hybrids are obviously breeding with non-augmented humans. So it's just like uh, putting a dye in a swimming pool, you know, to where it permeates. And it seems to me from everything I've read that the purpose was to not have us destroy ourselves. You know, the craft yeah. that showed up at the nuclear plants that, that shut down the Minimet missiles, like Robert Solis's experiments, uh, experiences, those were happening also simultaneously in Russia and in other countries. So it's a very real phenomenon that these luminous orbs would show up at nuclear uh, missile sites and demonstrate the power to shut them down. And I think they're concerned about us uh, destroying the planet. Because as soon as we let off that first nuclear bomb in 1940, 45 uh, all different kinds of configurations of craft showed up from all different kinds of places and i think it's like throwing a firecracker in a book made of onion skin paper uh nuclear explosions actually adversely affect other dimensions so they had an interest in what we were doing because we were affecting their domain and they all flocked here to you know see what they could do about it and then when the abduction started i mean that was uh like taking a dog to a vet and setting it down and giving it shots and whatever it needed so that uh, the tremendous effort that's been made over the eons of terraforming this planet for intelligent life just didn't go up in a big ball of flames. That makes sense. Well, I don't know where my narrative fits in, but Janet seems to think it's important. So 
I'm not sure because oh, she goes just... to these UFO things. I don't. TJ, but... do you remember I when you said that? Uh... Go ahead. Yeah, let me let me tie it in a little bit, okay? Because I just got a lot of insights. Hold with the, that thought, Russell. Sort of okay. Okay. okay hold ahead. that. We'll come back. To it. Okay. So you you were saying that the violence was bred out of the beings that you interacted with, and from previous stories that there's there, there's five ships. So they have about a million personnel. There's the different ships are located outside of Mars. They're guarding a wormhole to protect this part of the universe, the solar system, from these beings that you called the wharf beings, which ironically is the, uh, the name that they call Klingon. the Klingon wharf, uh, <laughs> played by Michael Dorn and the uh, second uh, Next Generation series of Star Trek. So I, you know, I know. Gene Roddenberry uh, had some information he was leaking to the public, and we often get our information <laughs> from science fiction. So the wharf beings would come through. They're extremely violent. They're rape, pillage, plunder, and they would destroy planets. So when the grays, the little gray species went back to their planet, it was gone, totally devastated. So and to, um, to help pre uh, preserve other beings, other species, they look to humanity, which at one point we have a story where they read that they allowed the draconian uh, genetics to be introduced into the humanoid species. So we have uh, this current species, which has the uh, reptilian brains, uh, you know, brain. And so that we have the ability to hit, we have the ability to kill, we have the ability to defend ourselves, but apparently the species that you dealt with on that craft outside of Mars uh, did not have the ability. And I'll relate to our listeners a story that TJ told me earlier that they asked Tom to hit somebody. He didn't want to. But they said, no, you need to demonstrate how a human being can hit someone else. And he, he did. And then they asked him to kill somebody else. And he protested. But ultimately, he showed them, yes, here's how you kill. And so that was something they needed to reintroduce to their people and so that they would not be wiped out because you don't defend yourself. And that goes back to the original story, which Sasha knows better than I do, of how the Lyrans and the Dracos, uh, the Lyrans were peaceful, and all of a sudden the Dracons, Dracos came in. This is a, the, one of the origin stories that goes back millions, if not billions of years. And so we've had these ongoing wars, but apparently there's different parts of this vast series of universes that have peace but we're always encountering, uh, much to our chagrin and surprise often, this faction of existence in the grand continuum of all these universes that is so, so violent it has no regard for consciousness, no regard for life. So it's like the op we, we continually encounter the opposite end of the polarity, like it comes full circle, like the Ouroboros, the snake consuming its tail. And that point when we're consuming its tail shocks us every time time because we get so far out in our own reality of peace love and understanding that we just can't understand how someone has no regard for anybody else or anything else sasha well it's just the uh, the story that uh, swordlow and others have and it all comes down to uh, the peacemakers or the andromedans but in any case uh one of the first uh places that, that when the dracos came from uh Thuban, their, their main uh, uh, island, and they came upon the Draco, uh, the Lyran colonies. Uh, they blew up at Atlan, uh, one of the one of the uh, Atlas, one of the first uh, colonies. And eventually, the Atlans were settled on Atlantis, uh, and uh, they they went to war with the Dracos. And there was all there was the Council of Hatona was uh, called by the Andromedans to try to stop this war because. Uh, Lemur, both Lemuria and uh, Atlantis had been sunk in these in these wars, and the Greeks had broken away from Atlantis and so forth. So that uh, they, they by the Council of Hatona, twelve humanoid species and one Draco species, a different reptilian than the Dracos, because they had broken away from the Draco Empire, contributed to the genetics, and they made a basic human uh, prototype for all the different ET groups, of which there were dozens uh, on the Earth by the time this. Uh, Occurred. There were the, uh, the the Maldecans who had settled in the Gobi, and, as well as the Atlans, uh, who had settled on Atlantis, and uh, so that the brainstem is what the Dracos, uh, the reptilians, wanted for their, their particular genetics, and their, each of the groups uh, had their particular genetics designed to overshadow the others. But the Dracos wanted the brainstem because they could easily 
can you do mind conditioning and take over that way so that was their trip and so it goes on and on but that's a little of the background that uh, people uh, like uh, Swerdlow have, have talked about and it seems to be the same story that's coming in that the Andromedans have been able to mediate peace in this uh, solar system a few times. Okay, Russell, you had a question? Well, it's just kind of, I'm absorbing what Dr. Sasha Lesson just said. He's got a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, but going back to what you said about um, the frustration that you feel of trying to explain some of your experiences, uh, just a piece of information from my particular near-death experiences, I realized that we only have a very small portion of our totality of consciousness invested in this little physical life. There's other stuff that we're doing on other levels as we live this life. And it seems like a, um, the creatures that you are interacting with or the, or the beings that you're interacting with do have a correlation from the Urantia book. It's a celestial being known as the Ancients of Days, uh, which are basically overseers of the super universes. Our universe uh, coexists with a multitude of other universes through this brain system in a larger structure that's referred to as the super universe. Well, they're the celestial beings known as the Ancients of Days. Uh, they are sort of the overseers of the super universe. But you may, as we speak, be doing all kinds of things on other dimensions and other planets and other universes that your conscious mind in, in this particular lifetime uh, grapples with and has a very difficult time explaining. And I would just say to you as a friend, just don't worry about that aspect of it because um, you're, uh, you're a multidimensional being that's connected with other realities. And what you're doing over here, uh, you may have a difficult time explaining to anybody. So I'm really fascinated by your stories, by the way. I haven't really had a chance to listen to them like we're doing now. And uh, they're very interesting to me. Well, thank you. They just come out when they come out. But yeah, I definitely have another life. I have a, a parallel world I live in, and I have another reality where I'm actually... Uh, well, I don't know how to say this, but I mean, I, I'm very conscious that, that I'm here and I'm somewhere else always. So I'm very much. Yeah, I have, that, yeah, same thing. That, I have another yeah. job at night. I come back and I, I've been working all night at my other job and I describe where it is, the other city and my desk and my apartment and everything. So <laughs> I, we are multidimensional selves simultaneously existing in many realms, planets, dimensions, vibratory frequency, time zones, and at some point we become aware of some aspects of our multidimensionality, but there may be time, things that we're not aware of until we're past this, uh, this avatar that we're currently in. T uh, there's limitations of this avatar, which, you know, I understand they're in place so we can fully be present in this existence and you know pay attention to what we need to do and accomplish but uh if it was always bleeding through we'd be considered insane and wouldn't be able to function and, and you know achieve anything but we're here and um, some of us as we learn and grow and become uh, we understand that this is happening we can uh, hold space like a center and uh, you know dance with yet another aspect of our multi-dimensionality our our sub personalities and embrace it all and, and Hopefully you get a nice person like my husband that you can talk to about. If you can't talk about it, then you, you start to think, well, I'm crazy. But if you have friends and peers like Russell and the people here on the show, you can talk about this phenomenon. Then you can start getting, you know, sane and conscious and you'll find other people like the well, attraction. I used, I used to about. do channeling. You remember 20 or 30 years ago when I was teaching and I didn't know people were coming to me more and more and more until we created a huge spiritual community and then dr laura sturgis uh was a friend of mine and uh, we did uh people synergistically involved and then i did hello dynamics and she introduced me a couple of professors and then she regressed me back and gave the papers to the government <laughs> because i'd had et experiences so it's getting to be a big thing and then you know she had Great. me teaching people uh, and, and i'd take them to the planetarium and i'd show them star clusters and and uh, it was amazing and then helping them to open their minds and do do different things so that was a wonderful time and i hope somehow in the future i can create that again but i miss that but the government had another job for me to do so i had to leave hawaii and come back to the mainland but uh, russell i would like to do something in the future I, i'm really planning it with dr lesson and, and janet 
and of course a med here on the radio, but more than radio, and, and I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, but the, the woman that the government or whomever that recruited me here on the planet to work with it uh, was a very powerful older lady. She had a young lady with her. She walked with a cane, and uh, then, of course, I've been to Washington and all that, so we won't go there. But then when I was off planet, I also answered to a lady. And there was a council of 12 and the, the lady and then for the Supreme High Council. So they were ancients. And, and, you know, the only time I was able to ask about God, they just said, God has always been. So they won't go there. But they do let the various people that come and go from this planet that's involved with their this mid-level of existence between universes and, and dimensions or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I learned a lot there. I know a lot of things. Some of it's like Star Trek and other things are, I don't know what you'd call it, but I learned about various species. But talking to them is so absolutely amazing. And there were days when Tom and I had to wait three days for the uh, wormhole. Or, you know, we, they have wormhole technology, of course, but you have to wait till it uh, manifests different locations in the universe. So we would have to wait for the transmissions to go over to the like the Andromedan galaxy and then from there that we would be in contact with the higher universes I don't know how you want to call that but there is there is communication allowed it, not just uh, from your soul level you know how it, there's a level of people with ESP and I've been fortunate enough to be around those and learn a lot of it and then there's the level of existence that we do uh, military and uh, you know, protect the quadrant from these beings that aren't supposed to be in our universe. But uh, we're supposed to have a 16-year window from that, from a you know wormhole that if they come. So that's why they're up there patrolling, you know, all the time. And then uh, and they didn't, you know, they just are. So I guess that's like the galaxy, or the guardians of the I, I, guardians of the galaxy. Guardians of the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, He's and, a guardian of the galaxy. Yeah. Sasha's something to say. I never found out about the flash. What about the flash? The solar flash. Yeah, let's go back what was that. that. Well, the solar flash, Fragile Credi, according to Zoroastrian eschatology, uh, it's a, a solar event that allegedly happens every 25,920 years where the souls that resonate on a uh, high enough frequency get to go on and be in the fourth dimensional reality, and then everybody oh. else stays here or stays in the physical universe or is recycled somehow and it sort of coordinates with uh, an old contactee uh, he's deceased now Richard Kinniger he wrote a book called The Ultimate Frontier and he talks of the progression of the life waves where people who have achieved what he was calling mastership go on to the next level and then everybody else is recycled back to a stone age existence so uh, Wilcock talks a lot about the solar flash <laughs> And uh, he's expecting it imminently. Of course, he wrote the book Source Field Investigation and made specific reference to the year 2012. Well, 2012 came and went. So now they're thinking it was a, it's a window, you know, between 2012 and 2080, somewhere in there, where this is supposed to happen. And but there are anomalies going on within our solar system that indicate. Uh, there is a science behind this solar flash where everything does seem to be heating up. It's not only heating up here on Earth, but on other planets as well. And um, so maybe, you know, Zoroastrians were onto something. Well, I Isn't, that that the Isn't that just the ascension? TJ, back in the 80s, got the, the, got the word ascension or something that you... Tell us how you got the uh, ascension. You started talking about the ascension... Oh, yeah, I got, real, I got real uh, connected to people before we had uh, internet, and I was running a corporation, and I knew about the internet and the computers because I'd use them, just forgot that they wasn't on the planet where I was using them, so that was a little embarrassing, but, <laughs> you know, I'd try walking up to something like a microwave and telling it to do something, and it doesn't do it, so that's interesting, <laughs> too. it's very embarrassing, so anyway, <laughs> traveling has <laughs> time traveling, I guess. But anyway, when I was uh, over in Hawaii, uh, a lightning came and split a tree, and I got this Ascension and this this logo, and I was like, what was that for? And they kept giving me the name Ascension. So these are those beings. I didn't know who to call them, so I just said, well, my father's Zeus, because I didn't know how to relate to all that. You know, my, my name is Thurmond in this lifetime, so it was called Thor's Protection. So I was born 
with my father's Thurmund for Thor's protection name. So I just assumed God and Thor and all these people were real, okay? Because this stuff was happening to me. So uh, they told me to do the Ascension Center, and I didn't even know what that was. So I didn't even know what the word Ascension meant. But, you know, apparently these lifetimes I've had coming and going and being taken up and all that, it serves a purpose, you know? And that purpose is to keep going. And, you know, I, I'm always asking for guidance and, you know, I report in and I do my thing. So, but the Ascension Center was to be a, a time like the Ascension Age after 12, 21, 12, which I knew we were doing 11, 11, 87. And I remember uh, Solara and all these people doing that. So I, I related it to that. But then when you're talking about the solar flash, that was after the, uh, which we already had the rift and a lot of that's true. But uh, from what I got, because I get a bigger picture and I get to see time, space and the continuum, I guess you'd say, but I get to see it rolling in and out like these rolling things. And I can do time and, and space, time travel and working with people like uh, the guy Anderson. And anyway, I was working with all these different people. They were chosen on the planets or like Tesla, Einstein, or they pick these beings and give them certain information. But uh, back then, there was only, uh, there wasn't any people. So some rich people in California were trying to find out who, who was getting all this information. So I started using channeling. But the ascension became a reality, and, and I've got the connection for the books and the, and the cut colors. And they, they made it dumbed down for babies, okay, back to how they brought in the Eastern Western philosophy and taught the chakra system. And the ascension became the raising of the energy and teaching you how to use your nervous system. And that, you know, our nervous system is our other brain. And, and it's like after seven hours from the time we conceive. And, or, you know, that is the reality. So I was supposed to teach all this. So I thought that when 12, 21, 12 got here was the window. And then I learned it was going to be 2020 after the solar flash. So the ascension age is supposed to be now. And then I'm supposed to be teaching all this stuff. So, uh, but, you know, so is everybody else. So I started teaching it years ago and it got caught on. So I, I got uh, hands on and gold and the gold pyramid in the 80s. Stephen Halpern was there. He's been on our radio show. Anyway, it welcomed in the 80s and this new movement. And it wasn't the new age. It was the ascension age, but it really didn't happen. And then we had a, uh, benchmarked for 12 21 12 which we all did but it didn't and people weren't awake yet so we had to uh, add the solar flash which was 2017 which was just happened which was the 21st of august and then you have two and a half years and it puts it at 2020 so i, I don't know how to do that in your term on your 2000 whatever you say nine five thousand or 920 but i used to say that didn't i janet the same thing russell says remember years ago yes when she, I, I used to use that too that term russell so where are you getting that term but that is the ascension and we're supposed to be teaching it what i know everybody. well um right. it came to me just in my own head when i wrote the book because it says uh, manipulation of humankind by hidden ufo intelligences and the quest for transcendence i used the word transcendence before i even tied in with any of Wilcox material talking about the Ascension. He just wrote a book called The Ascension Mysteries, you know, where he's talking about Fragile Coretti and the impending solar flash. There's an interesting dovetail into fundamentalist Christian circles, too, because you hear about the rapture where in a twinkling of an eye, uh, there'll be a transformation and people will meet the Lord in the air and uh, the, a new heaven and a new earth, everything will become new. So <clears throat> in just about every culture on earth, they have some version of this event where the sun sheds its corona somehow and uh, it winds up doing some sort of dimensional shift where uh, the beings on the human life wave that resonate at a certain frequency move on to some other level. And then everybody else, uh, you know, either stays here. I, I don't know what happens to them. There's some of them transcend. I've seen it happen. I've also seen some go back to the black box. And now I don't, uh, I've seen them go into the underbelly where they that's called heaven and hell, but they actually there's heaven and hell here on earth allegedly is purportedly in our mythos, but uh, it's basically saying the same thing that they do universally. So when they divide up the, the beings or those that you say they, they reincarnate or come back and have to do it again. So that's the explanation for that. But uh, the ones that the I don't. Box. Yes. So the, what, like, it, it, it means Santa Claus found. 
found out who is naughty and who is nice. Yeah, it's a service to sell, service to others, that sorts us, and yeah, <laughs> naughty and nice. And so the black box, the, the the belly, the down under. Anyway, um, you'll have to explain these terms. We're running out of time. <laughs> uh, we, we'll have to do this again, maybe even next weekend if you're available, Russell. But uh, what's a black box, TJ? Before you get too far. I, well, you that's true. It's it's like uh, the the place where you get reassembled. You know, they they used it even in Egypt when they would redo people and try to put them together with all kind of things. So where did you see they this? Were, I didn't see it. You I said that you saw it. this. You I saw didn't. this. Where did you see this? Well, it's it's a term. It's a, a it's a term you for. You saw it. It's a okay, soul Sasha recreation. It, it's it's like a. Yeah, I know exactly. Ibsen used the same thing uh, in uh, Peer Gint, where Peer Gint was going to be uh, thrown back into the button molder so he wouldn't be a specific individual anymore because he was a failure. He right. wasn't true and, to and himself. And even Michael Newton talks about it. But I, my question is, where did you see this? You said you saw it. Well, where well, and what did you see okay, if you've got to be literal, uh, I saw it in the when oh, I was in. Side. Oh my gosh! Okay, here we go. Sorry, folks. We'll have to come back next Saturday. Tune in. To be Moscow's freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. The blood is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, the heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real the only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future it is a product of our imagination causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist that is near insanity and do not misunderstand me danger is very real but fear is a choice we are all telling ourselves a story you're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Radio. She travels to Earth through the rainbow crystal bubbles from the furthest reaches of space and time, across the dimensions, through the elements, and in harmony with the colors of the universe. Through her mastery of abstract stream of consciousness malapropisms, she weaves a web of comic, satiric, cosmic conversation. Her subjects can range from Norman, the goose next door, to astrology and Earth changes and into the deep recesses of the soul matrix. She holds a wealth of knowledge on herbs, plants, and astrology. 
Join Mona and her guests on Adventures of a Feral Hippie as she touches the earthly radio waves five days a week at 2 p.m. Monday to Friday on Studio B at Revolution Radio. The Secret Society Revealed. 